can you do with just one wire? Cut a cake? Sure, I've done that lots of times. An energy-conscious way to hang clothes? Absolutely. A line that connects two tin cans across the alley to your friend's house while you plot revenge on your older sister? Okay, that one might just be me. But what about a single wire in our electronic design lives? Funny thing, we can do a lot with just one wire. We just have to go about it the right way. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. If you're working on a connection-constrained or I.O.-constrained design, a one-wire solution may be the perfect way for you to power and operate your I2C or SPI endpoints. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Scott Jones from Maxim Integrated joins me to discuss Maxim's one-wire DS28E18 communications bridge. Scott and I chat about how we can leverage just one wire to address a common set of system challenges, what the sequencer commands look like for I2C and SPI interface signaling, and how you can check out the DS28E18 communications bridge for yourself. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Maxim Integrated. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, I appreciate you having me here today. Okay, so Scott, we're talking about just one wire, and I think that's a first for Jock Talk. So, Scott, what exactly are we going to do with that single wire? That, in fact, is what some engineers that our customers ask, you know, when they add some sort of a function or capability to an I.O. constrained system, where there may be, you know, like only one pin available in a connector or maybe a couple of spare port pins in a microcontroller to do something. But one wire is an interface technology unique to Maxim. It's been around since, you know, the 1980s. With it, we're able to deliver power and data over a single dedicated connection. So there's actually two contexts total with this interface. There's the one wire, you know, single connection, as well as a ground that we utilize. And so with this, we can actually talk at two different data rates, two different communication speeds, 11.7 kilobit per second and 62.5 kilobit per second. So these aren't, you know, blazingly fast. We're not going to move gigabytes of data over this in any meaningful period of time. But for the applications that we target with this technology, it's, you know, kind of a perfect communication speed. And we have a variety of these one-wire devices. We call them slave devices or endpoints that have different functionality for an application. You know, in addition to providing the solution to, you know, adding capability to a maybe a connection-constrained application, it's also powerful for applications where you want to just simplify, you know, wiring complexity. So as I said, you know, one connection to deliver power and data, as well as simplifying wiring complexity, we'll see where we can actually communicate over some reasonably long distances with the technology. Okay, so Scott, what kind of applications would this kind of setup be good for? So if we have an application where we need to connect to either a local or remote I2C or, or SPI device, that's really where this technology is going to fit well. And the product we're talking about today is the DS28E18. We can think of this as a bridge device from one wire to SPI. So if you look at the block diagram in the right side of our image here, you can see a system level approach to how this would be used. On the left side, we have a host system, which could be just you know a microcontroller, fairly low complexity, as you can see. Then on the right side, our product, the DS28E18, and in this you know, example showing it connected to a SPI device. So a very simple approach here to connect our part up. As you can see, the two connections, the one wire I.O. and ground. And that's really all it takes uh, you know, to make this happen. So back to the applications, could be environmental sensing, temperature, humidity, for example. Could be medical sensors that uh, we're using to measure some uh, patient function or just you know, accessory or peripheral identification and control. Okay, so Scott, what's under the hood of this DS28E18? Yeah, in a little more detail, you know, the block diagram on the right here shows uh, exactly what's under the hood. If we break this into kind of the left half and the right half, on the left side of this image, it really contains the one-wire capability of this product. So we have a one-wire interface, command control, the 64-bit ROM ID. Think of it as a serial number. And we have a unique ROM ID or serial number in each and every one of these parts and all of our one-wire products for that matter. So it provides a nice, you know, electronic method of uh, serializing some end product and also can identify, you know, whether it's a DS28E18 sitting out there or one of our other products. 
here we have a 144 byte command buffer that allows us to get information from the one wire interface over to the right half of this block diagram. And there's also a 16 bit CRC to make sure that we don't have, you know, some bit error when we're communicating from a host system to our device. On the right side, there's three main blocks that, are, you know, kind of important. We have a command sequencer an SRAM that has, you know, data in it to ultimately, you know, kind of operate this part. And then a, an interface controller for, you know, SPY or I2C as well as GPIO. And we'll talk more about, you know, each of these in the upcoming slides. Another point I wanted to make here is, you know, if we're going to connect to an I2C or a SPY device, you know, with this one wire technology, we've got to have some way to get power out to that device. And so, again, with this part, we're able to power harvest from one wire up to 10 milliamps to power that externally connected SPI or I2C component. And this part comes in a nice, you know, tiny little package, two millimeter by three millimeter TDFN. If I can touch on, on each of those uh, three main components in a little more detail, the command sequencer, power delivery, as well as the SPI or I2C or GPIO, you know, interface control. And so the sequencer, that's, you know, kind of the key capability of this product. And that's colored in teal in this block diagram. So as we spoke, the one-wire interface is, is involved in all of this, of course. We're delivering data to our product over one wire to this 144-byte command buffer. That's going to ultimately go over to the SRAM on the right side of this, this image here. So we have a 512-byte sequencer. So we might you know, need to pass over multiple 144-byte chunks, if you will, to that SRAM to ultimately fill the sequencer, should it need to be filled for the application. But we have this sequencer memory that exists in SRAM. We have result and status bytes that tell us, you know, whether things are being done successfully and then a configuration register to kind of set this part up to operate as SPI or I2C and so on. And then the command sequencer in the center, you know, is the heart of this product again. And so with this, what we're doing is we're taking data from that 512 byte portion of SRAM and we're using it to control an attached SPI or I2C device. And so that's the sequence data is a sequence of commands or data that we would use to operate that external device. So for example, if it's a humidity sensor, we have commands to enable it, commands to make a measurement. There might even be some data that we need to push out to it. And then we're going to read from that humidity sensor ultimately, and we're going to put that data back into the predefined location within our sequencer. So then once all this is done, our host system can actually get that information. And another really cool thing about this part is we can have multiple sequences in that sequencer. It's very flexible. So we could have two I2C devices, just an example, attached to this. And you could have one sequence for one device and a second sequence uh, for the other device. And then we can execute those sequences exactly the way we need to, either both you know, one after the other or just let them both run through without stopping. Okay, cool. So Scott, what are we looking at when it comes to sequencer commands here? Yeah, so if we have, you know, an I2C device attached to our product or a SPI device attached to our product, we're going to have different commands that exist within our sequencer to control those devices. In the case of I2C, we have start and stop commands that would, on the I2C bus itself, create those events, a start or a stop. We're going to write data, read data, and even read data with a NAC, which would, you know, terminate a read transaction. With SPI, similarly, we have SPI write and read bytes and write and read bits, turning on, you know, a slave select, think of it as a chip enable or turning it off. And then we also have, you know, within a configuration register, the ability to either select, you know, SPI or I2C configuration, the communication speed and the SPI mode, you know, SPI mode zero or three, which, you know, sets clock polarity and phase. So once we have sequencer data loaded into the part, you know, the next step would be to run the sequencer. And we have just that, a run sequencer command that would, in turn, take the data out of SRAM, like we talked about, and then execute that sequence when it comes to sending commands out to the attached device, sending data to it if that's necessary, reading data from it would typically be the case, and putting that information back into the sequencer at the appropriate spot within that array. Really, kind of a beauty with this part is we can get this sequencer loaded up with commands to operate externally attached devices that might have a little bit of modest complexity to them. And then with very few, a small number of, of one-wire commands, so very low overhead, execute that sequence and, again, operate these devices that would be attached and normally would you know, take quite a bit of communication overhead to make that happen. And there's also, as I mentioned earlier, a result byte and status information to get quick indications of whether something was done successfully or we had an error. Okay, so Scott, what are we looking at when it comes to power delivery to these endpoints? Yeah, so with that, we again have some commands to enable it. 
If we look at this block diagram from the left side, we have the I.O. connection. This is where we would have you know, the one wire interface attached. And then on the right side, in Teal, we have this Sense VDD pin, which is an output. So what we're doing is we're delivering from one wire, you know, in a kind of a harvest sense, power from the one wire line over to the sense VDD output. To make that happen, we have, you know, commands to turn on that sense VDD or turn it off. And then we also have a delay command. So if you can imagine we have an attached device, could be making humidity measurements. So we would apply power. Maybe we're going to actually make a humidity measurement. And then we need to apply that power for a few milliseconds of time wait for that to complete, and then read the data. So this delay command allows that to happen, you know, that power event to happen while the device is actually uh, making a humidity measurement. So the delays can be from one millisecond to 32 seconds, whatever is required again for the application. And we talked about the ability to deliver 10 milliamps over that path as well. So that really allows us to operate just a large number of products, you know, SPI or I2C devices that might exist and be needed for an application. The final point, you know, I want to make on this, the final bullet is this concept of uh, needing to apply a one wire strong pull up. And, and really what that means is when we're applying power, we just need to make sure that we've got, you know, a good solid connection to the one wire IO pin of this part when that's happening. And I showed in an earlier block diagram, you know, a simple microcontroller with an external P channel that we would turn on, which would effectively short, you know, a VCC supply to the one wire line and create this, you know, strong pull up condition when we're applying power. It's very simple to do, but I mean, it's just a detail that needs to be uh, thought about when we're using the part. Okay, Scott, can we talk about the interface control as well? Yeah, sure. So we have the ability to communicate with I2C or SPI peripheral slave devices. So with that, we can operate at uh, multiple different you know, clock frequencies. So with I2C, 100, 400 kilohertz, 1 megahertz. SPI, 100, 400 kilohertz, 1 meg, and 2.3 meg. So a lot of flexibility there. The other thing would be GPIOs that this part supports, uh, depending on the configuration. If we're talking to an I2C device, you know, there's two connections. There's serial data, serial clock, SDA, SCL, and this block diagram. And so we then have, you know, two spare pins available to us, and we can configure those two spare pins as GPIOs, and then we have commands to operate those GPIOs, you know, turn a GPIO on or off or sense the state at that GPIO. When we're operating in a SPI mode, it requires four pins to operate a SPI device. We have, you know, serial clock, MISO, MOSI, which is serial in, serial out, as well as slave select, you know, kind of enable that external SPI device. So all of those Controls are handled, you know, again, with commands, sequence commands, or these utility commands when it comes to the GPIO. Okay, so Scott, what kind of applications do you see this kind of technology playing an important role in? It can really be used in, in a broad range of applications. Medical sensors is one. So, for example, as shown in this image here, we have some medical device with some cabling out to sensors, again, that we'd be making measurements you know, on a patient, you can imagine we'd want to do that with minimal wiring complexity. So our part, our DS28 E18 could be at the end of one of these cables attached to some sort of a device making a measurement, a very simple way to get that functionality added. Headset controls would be another example where, for example, on maybe on the left side of a headset, we've got buttons to turn volume up, turn volume down, or some other audio controls. And we want to move that information over to the other side of the headset where there may be a codec, for example. And so Doing that with one wire across, uh, you know, this uh, headband would be a nice way to minimize complexity. And then we can deliver I2C or SPI data to the other side, to the codec on the other side. Environmental monitoring could be temperature, humidity measurement, and could be doing this again at distances that could be up to 100 meters in length. Okay, so Scott, if I'm ready to get started, what are my next steps? Yeah, so the next steps would be to get in touch with Mauser, who's, who's helping you know, sponsor this today, and acquire either the DS28 E18 IC or an EV kit. They're going to have both of those uh, readily available. We've also got some design resources. We have two reference designs. I'll talk a little bit more about both of those. And we've got a nice application note available that goes into the basics of the part and just describes you know, how to get it going and, and how to use it in a variety of applications. So on these reference designs, the first one is shown here. A little more complexity to the reference design itself, but we still, you know, are operating with one wire. But on the left side of this, we have a Raspberry Pi based implementation with a nice LCD screen, nice graphical interface to control everything. That's attached to an adapter that we use in a lot of our EV kits. So it's got a USB to one wire on the output of this adapter. Again, once we get out of this adapter, we're back to the world of one wire, everything we've talked about today. 
So in this reference, you can see we've got three of the DS28 E18s that are part of it. One is communicating to an I squared C temperature and humidity sensor, the second to an I squared C UV light sensor, and the third to a SPI accelerometer. And so what we did with this reference design, it's kind of a little fun little project. We were emulating a greenhouse. And so we we're measuring these different parameters that might exist, you know, within a greenhouse temperature and so on. And so the design resources for this, the schematic, the C source, everything that you would need to actually implement this is available freely from our website. Second reference design, a little less complexity, but uh, very practical to customer applications would be communicating from a Cortex M4 based micro. Spare port pins on that micro is shown here. We have two port pins, two are DS28 E18, two either an I squared C or a SPI slave device. And we have, you know, the code would support both. But again, reference design, schematics for this implementation freely available, you know, from our website. Excellent. Well, Scott, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me yet again. Thank you so much, Amelia. I appreciate you having me here. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Maxim Integrated. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.